Fighting games are an ever-growing popular genre. The fighting game genre has been the mainstay in the games industry for a plethora of decades. It has spawned arguably eternal franchises such as Mortal Kombat, Tekken, and Street Fighter that are all well known around the world. They have a unique competitive nature and a complexity that pushes players to achieve the highest levels of play. With the long history of fighting games as a game genre, some players have been throwing fireballs as Ryu or freezing opponents as Sub-Zero for over 20 years. The complexities of these games take years to master. This is Dr. Ryan Thompson, professor of musicology at Michigan State University. There's definitely a big overlap, right? Like even in the way you get good at fighting games, like I can finish Uncharted on almost the highest difficulty, I'm still working on the very hardest one, but like I'm, I'm a good player, right? But I don't practice Uncharted by like going into a special practice room and learning a routine to move Nathan Drake around, right? That, that's not how you become good at that game. It really is not. Uh, similarly, if I like want to be good at Call of Duty, like I can shoot at still targets in like an isolated practice area, but that's like maybe a quarter of being good at that game, right? Whereas fighting games, and I do understand there's a whole neutral game, like I could talk to you for an hour on like what it is to play Marvel and do mm -hmm. well, but there's a significant portion of that that it is hitting the training room, just like you're practicing piano, like on your own, by yourself. It's not the same as performing in front of other people, right? But you've got to put in that time or you're never going to be able to play the same game right. as somebody who just walks in and puts up their quarter. Rhythm is the cornerstone of this complexity. From every move you hit to every combo string that you successfully land, rhythm is an integral part of the play experience in fighting games. However, Rhythm is often overlooked in video game studies research and is not thoroughly explained to players of these games. In this video essay, I will demonstrate that Rhythm has a great influence on fighting games, that it can help players achieve higher levels of play, and that it can create unique gameplay experiences. Before we get in depth with fighting games, however, we must first get an understanding of how Rhythm is used in games generally and how players interact with audio inside of these games. After presenting the basics of audio and rhythm in games, I will give you an overview of fighting game terminology before detailing how rhythm can be used by high-level players of these games. Through this research, I hope to show that there's a natural rhythm in fighting games and that a better sense of rhythm can help develop a player's skill. Rhythm games test a player's technical ability to recreate rhythms. Usually themed after music or dance, rhythm games have found mass appeal in pop culture, with games such as Dance Dance Revolution and Guitar Hero gaining massive commercial success in the States and worldwide. Players continue to improve themselves at these games and break boundaries of skills not that possible. Games like Guitar Hero and Rock Band take this concept and have players simulate a performance as if they were the ones making the music. How is the feeling of a performance simulated for the player? In these games, players wield a guitar-shaped controller with buttons to simulate frets. When the song begins, colored nodes fall from the top of the screen, and players must hit the matching colored buttons on the controller while simultaneously hitting a switch that acts as a strum. Much like a real performance, these two inputs must be activated at the same time to continue the musical output. If not executed properly, the music will be interrupted by a flub note to accent the player's missed input. At the end of each song, players are scored for their performance on a point system, usually judged by how many notes they hit correctly and the number of notes played in succession before a mistake occurs. Players can select from a vast library of popular songs and perform for cheering virtual fans. Blending ludic elements with reality is a phenomenon Kiri Miller calls a schizophonic performance. Schizophonic is a term coined by Canadian composer R. Murray Schaefer, which means the ability to separate sound from its source, schizo meaning split, and phonic meaning sound, imply the uneasiness or unnatural sense of separating a sound from a physical object. A secondary effect of this is the brain's ability to reassociate schizophrenic sounds with a new source.
film Silent Theorist, Michelle Shion describes it as a spontaneous and irresistible mental fusion, completely free of any logic that happens between a sound and a visual when they coincide. The association of sounds with new images gives the visual new meaning. This is one of the main principles of modern sound design. We can hear the sound of frying bacon, but associated with a heavy rainstorm. Or we can hear the sounds of celery stalks snapping, and associated with breaking bones. In the instances of Guitar Hero and Rock Band, the player is activating pre-recorded music and is not performing the composition in the literal sense. The source of the sound is the original recorded performance of the music, but with this visual now omitted, the sound is now associated with the player. They are not only involved with the gameplay, but are now engaged physically with the controller that keeps the performance going. Players feel the effects of their mistakes, and their virtual fans will acknowledge them of these blunders with boos or cheers. Every missed note means an interruption of their performance. The player's skill is ultimately what determines how the performance goes. Karen Collins said, when players produce sounds in the game, in the sense that they are immediately receiving feedback for their own actions, they are experiencing those sounds cognitively as their sounds, because players receive immediate feedback tied to their own perceptive or kinesthetic actions. The sounds become a part of self rather than other. In this way, sound helps players to become a character, or perhaps more accurately, their character can become a part of their sense of self. However, not all rhythm games fall under this phenomenon of schizophonic performance. Games like Rhythm Heaven don't simulate performance, they engage players in the music by a different means. Rhythm Heaven, or as it's known in Japan, Rhythm Tengoku, is a series originally released in 2006. Rhythm Heaven uses tiny minigames accompanied by cartoonish visuals to test players' ability to follow the rhythm. These minigames can range from something tame, like hidden baseballs, to outlandish events, like shooting peas into someone's mouth. Instead of using tablature or nodes to visualize when a player should time their inputs, Rhythm Heaven uses audiovisual cues to demonstrate when and where players should react. In a minigame, Monkey Watch, players follow a monkey perched on the second hand of a giant watch face. An announcer counts out 1, 2, 3, 4, and the players must high five the yellow monkeys that pop out of the clock. Players must press on beats 2 and 4 to keep the music going successfully. Every couple of bars, this pattern of inputting on 2 and 4 changes. Suddenly, two pink monkeys appear, and the player has to high five them on the offbeats of the music. This visual difference helps the player understand the rhythmic pattern shift. This is an example of how Rhythm Heaven uses visuals to help guide the players. But sometimes, the visual elements are subtracted. A place we can see this is in the minigame Air Rally. The player must volley a shuttlecock back and forth between two planes. The game's cat character sings along with the level's music and helps guide the player to when they're supposed to beat. At the start of the game, the cat counts the player off. They must input on every downbeat. Throughout the minigame, the player will have to change to hit in on two and four which will be indicated by the cat singing a little jingle separate from the level's music. After the jingle, the cat counts aloud 2, 3, 4, helping to guide the player further by providing an actual tempo of the music to follow. These audio cues become very important, as the characters become obscured later in the game by the clouds in the sky. Up until this point, a player could just watch the volley and time it with the visuals. Now the visual elements are removed, players have to use their internalized rhythm to continue the volley successfully. Another game that presents music similarly is Bit Trip Runner. Bit Trip Runner, released in 2011, is a unique gameplay experience as it blends elements of an old school platformer with aspects of a rhythm game. Players take control of Commander Video as he continuously sprints towards the right side of the screen. In his way are traps, pitfalls, and walls. What isn't evident at first is that the player is a part of the music. Each trap and obstacle can be mapped to the beat of the music. 
and these obstructions are often repeated patterns. Stephen Reality calls these reciprocated patterns obstacle motives. Similar to how music uses motives to help guide the listener, this helps guide players from level to level by giving them a sense of familiarity with past gameplay motives. These obstacles, lined up with a score, can show the repetition and the patterns in which they occur. The obstacles in the second zone of the level impetus are spikes, pitfalls, and walls. Players must leap over these to avoid a game over. When looking at the obstacles in this level, spikes land on beat 1 or 3, pitfalls land on beat 1, and walls on beat 2. This is what the opening sequence looks like on sheet music. These motives return in other zones of the level. In zone 11, as more obstacles are introduced, the spikes landing on beats 1 and 3 and walls on beat 2 stay consistent. The players learn more about the mechanics and gain muscle memory from these obstacle motives. Bitchert Runner is what I like to categorize as a character-based rhythm game, as opposed to a performance-based one, like Guitar Hero or Rock Band. In these games, players take control of a character and are confined to the rhythm of the music, indirectly involved with the music. These games are usually unique, as they blend gameplay elements and mechanics that are often not paired together. As mentioned before, Bitshirt Runner is an old school platformer that has aspects of a rhythm game. Another game that does something along these lines is Crept of the Necrodancer. Crept of the Necrodancer is a roguelike that blends elements of an action adventure game with the rhythm. The game's main mechanic is that players' actions are strictly conformed to the beat of the music. Anytime a player moves, uses an attack, or opens a door, it must all land on the beat of music. Not only can you listen to the music for the tempo, but there's a visual display for the beat at the bottom of the screen. Don't properly time your action, you're left vulnerable to being attacked. Players navigate through different dungeons taking on bosses and solving puzzles. Players can also pick up items that affect the rhythm or tempo of the music and help the player move freely around the dungeons. The mechanic of actions linked to an overarching beat is also in a game called Bullets Per Minute. Bullets Per Minute, or BPM, is a first person shooter slash rhythm game. This combination doesn't seemingly complement each other, but the game's mechanics allow for an experience unlike anything else. Players select from a cast of characters with unique traits and gameplay styles as they travel through vast dungeons fighting different creatures and monsters while trying to stay on the beat. Players have to follow the rhythm of the music to do pretty much anything in the game. Shooting their weapons, reloading, and dashing are all locked to the beat. The beat indicator is in the middle of the screen. Players can perform an action on the downbeat or offbeat. Playing syncopated rhythms allows for a more intense, faster gameplay style. However, since this game is so unique, coming from a traditional first-person shooter is a huge learning curve. You can't just shoot everything in sight as fast as you want. You have to keep constant time and be aware of when you can shoot or have to reload. If you miss the beat, you won't be able to shoot, which can mean game over. Though Rhythm Heaven and character-based rhythm games aren't necessarily replicated in a performance like Guitar Hero or Rock Band, it still can be considered a performance. Players still wield power of their music. If a player misses a cue in Rhythm Heaven, there's an interruption in the piece. In Bitshit Runner, if a player fails to avoid an obstacle, it's game over. This quote comes from Chris Dolan, a former editor for Kill Screen Magazine. It helps put this into perspective. All apologies to those who think video games have grown more and more like the movies, but no matter how cinematic they become, the form with which they have most common is music. Both forms marry performance and production, gut and theory, and repetition and spontaneity. Neither one is complete until the work gets a player, and a classic one endure a million renditions as a performance move from practice to mastery to reinvention. Games are a form of expression for each person who plays them. You choose how you play and what goals you hope to achieve inside these games. In RPGs, 
You can build your class to suit your preferred playstyle. In the shooter, you get to select your loadout or what weapons you use. And in the fighting game, you can select from a vast roster of characters with different gameplay styles. The idea of choice and individuality is what makes video games such a unique form of media. The equipment players use allows them to interact directly and participate in the performance. Controllers come in many styles and variations. In most games, the gamepad is the ideal choice. Controllers like the DualShock 4 and the Xbox controller have joysticks and triggers that allow them to play any kind of game. Most games are designed around these controllers. In fighting games, the most common controller is the fight stick, modeled after arcade cabinet controls. These controllers have one large joystick and usually have six or eight face buttons. They are perfect for any fighting game and allow for quick, precise inputs. As mentioned earlier, some controllers are modeled after real instruments, like the Guitar Hero Guitar Controller. This helps enhance the performance aspect of the gameplay. Rather than just pressing buttons or triggers, you are strumming and having your hands on the frets. Another controller similar to this is the Dance Dance Revolution mat. Dance Dance Revolution is a rhythm game centered around dance. Instead of a handheld traditional controller, Dance Dance Revolution uses a mat or dance floor style controller. Players input commands with their feet to simulate dancing. These controllers are the means by which players can express themselves. They input the commands to engage the game. They make the decisions that dictate how their playthrough goes. Without the players, there is no game. Like music without performance, there is no music. Though these controllers aren't actively playing music, they are the means by which these virtual performances are cultivated. This interaction between players and the audio inside these games makes them such an interesting form of media. Interactive audio is a fundamental part of video games, but many people are, are under the impression that it's in the same vein as audio for film or TV. Unlike film or TV, which are static forms of media, video games are interactive and change from playthrough to playthrough. Soundtracks and sound effects can grow and evolve based on the actions happening around them in the game world. One of the defining aspects of interactive audio is dynamic soundtracks. Dynamic soundtracks are compositions that can evolve and change in drastic ways. One place we can see this is in the game series Mario Kart. For the first two laps of the race, the music plays at a steady tempo. But once the third lap hits, the music ramps up in speed. This helps allude to the players that this is the final stretch. To some players, it can be stressful to hear this increase in tempo. For others, it can mean a relief as they are far enough ahead for certain victory. A common technique often seen in dynamic soundtracks is shift in arrangements. Tracks inside games that can change orchestration, textures, or styles based on what environment you are in or what events are triggered inside the game world. Some fighting games take this concept and apply it to its format. In the game Tekken 4, the arrangements of tracks change based on what round the match is in. Welcome at the start of the match, the track is at its most calm or technically light, and will continue to ramp up as the match goes on. Let's listen to the track Bit Crusher from the city stage. In the first round, we hear a groove played by the bass and the jazz organ, with the horns following soon after. When the player gets the round win and blow, the horns will play a big hit, followed by a fall. Where round two starts, we get a whole new section of the piece with vocals along with the groove. After the vocals, the horns come in strong with the melody. Later in the round, the jazz organ plays a ripping solo, ramping up the intensity to 11. This establishes the fight's progression and allows players to connect with the music while they fight. In some games, these section shifts aren't as noticeable or aren't separated and track arrangements shift seamlessly based on the player's interactions. One example of this technique is in the game Monkey Island 2. Originally released in 1992 for PC, Monkey Island 2 is a point-and-click adventure game. While traversing the game's environments, players can hear the music change textures while exploring new areas. When a player enters a new area, two beats of the original arrangement continue to play, 
and on B3, the new instruments or tune will come in. This creates a seamless transition between the different arrangements of the music. The game Street Fighter 4 not only does something similar, but provides players with helpful audio cues for specific events in a match. When the player fills their super meter, the music moves to a B section. And if a player has low health, the music becomes more hectic. Changing parts of the music arrangement helps the players understand what's happening in the match and perhaps cues them on how they should play. If they hear the B section of a track, they may need to be more careful to avoid being hit with a super. In the reboot of Killer Instinct, released in 2013, players control the music with their combos. When players hit a certain amount of hits in their combo, a chorus of their character's music will play. A seamless transition between different themes based on player skill. Players essentially become the composer and change the music at will if they are skilled enough. This is very evident at the end of matches. When the player defeats their opponent, they are allowed to perform an ultra combo. An ultra combo is a chance to achieve a long flashy string that can go as long as the player can keep it going. The sound designers to help develop the game added a level of music interactivity in ultra combo mechanic. A colossal music motif will play whenever a player hits the opponent. Players directly get to create monumental musical moments with their own combos. This creative interactive audio technique creates a whole new level of expression for them. Because now, not only players coming up with combos, they can create different musical moments from those combos. This concept of the player as the composer is seen throughout many different games. Take for example, the fighting game Skullgirls. In this game, there's a playable character named Big Band. He's a jazz saxophone playing robot that uses attacks based on musical instruments. One of his most iconic moves is when he pulls out a playable trumpet. The player can input commands to play his notes in the trumpet. The notes span the entire 12 tones in multiple octaves, and players take advantage of this creative musical freedom and arrange pieces to be played by big band in matches. This can be seen as novel, but this adds a level of creative depth to the character and allows the player another form of expression. One of the most infamous examples of players as the composer is in the Legend of Zelda series. One of the main mechanics of the games are playable instruments, which players use to further the plot. In The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Link receives an ocarina, but by no means is this any normal ocarina. As the name suggests, it's the Ocarina of Time. The ocarina is one of the core gameplay mechanics in the game. Players will learn how to play different melodies throughout their playthrough to help them navigate new areas, solve puzzles, or travel between different timelines. Shown as the finger in chart, for the ocarina. As you can see, it can play from B3 to F5, turning the controller into a means of creation. A quest inside of Ocarina of Time allows the player to create their own melodies, rather than playing the pre-existing one given to them. Players travel into Lake Hyla can encounter scarecrows in the field. Players who interact with the scarecrows will be given the task of playing a song. The player can create an eight-note composition, which becomes the scarecrow song. This is unique as it brings the player's creative expression into the game world. In sound design, there's a concept of diegetic and non-diegetic sound. Diegetic sounds are in the media's universe or any sound that the character can hear. An example is if a character in a film plays a piano, the song the character is playing is a diegetic sound. The characters in that movie hear the music inside the movie's world. A non-diegetic sound is any sound we hear that doesn't come from the universe of that media. Think about any background music that isn't being played by a character. What happens in Ocarina of Time is a whole different concept, as it essentially breaks the fourth wall. Players are actively creating a composition that comes from reality and exists in the game world. This can be considered the highest form of player expression, 
Not only do they create original compositions, but now it directly affects gameplay. Fighting game takes all these concepts of rhythm and interactive audio and uses them to create unique gameplay experiences for their players. As we dive deeper into fighting game examples, it's important to understand the complexities of the genre as to avoid confusion later. Fighting games are complex. Players need to master the movesets of individual characters while also knowing the strengths and weaknesses of their opponent. Fighting games are jam-packed with various techniques and unique game mechanics that players must master to play at the highest levels. Fighting games have a plethora of specific terminology that players use to identify and communicate these techniques. In terms of gameplay, having names for fighting game techniques or situations allow us to better consciously understand the games we sink so many hours into, a way of getting our minds to wrap around the myriad of actions performed by our characters. Much like music, the nomenclature is what performers use to bring pieces to life. The same can be said about fighting games, as players use these techniques to put on competitive bouts. Now as we get more into fighting game examples, we must understand the terminologies and mechanics that players use daily inside these games. Some fighting game terminology is used across multiple franchises and types of games. I would like to begin by detailing some of the universal language. And what better place to start then? At the start of every fighting game match, both players start in what's called the neutral game. The neutral game, sometimes called footsies, refers to when both players are trying to figure out what their opponent is trying to do. A neutral state for both players, neither player is being hit or comboed. Both will use movement and throw attacks to gain advantage on the opponent. Street Fighter is heavily focused on the neutral game. Players will try to chip away at their opponent's health while waiting for them to make a mistake. Once they catch the opponent off guard, they can capitalize and strike with a hard hit attack. Players also try to control the space around them. Players will throw projectiles to take control of spacing and force their opponents to change positions. Each character plays the neutral quite differently and has an optimal distance away from their opponent. Some prefer to be up close and personal with their opponent while others have a more modest approach and try to keep the opponent away while chipping away at their health. Combos, short for combination, are possibly the most essential mechanic across all fighting games. Combos are strings of attacks that link together to inflict large amounts of damage. In the original Street Fighter 2, players found that certain moves could be chained together to maximize damage output. Since then, combos have been an integral part of fighting game character movesets. Combos are what separates casual players from top level professionals. Combos can range from 3 hit strings to 30 second long sequences that can do significant damage to your opponent. Combos have a wide range of execution, meaning how difficult it is to successfully land a string. Each character has their own unique combos, so it's crucial to get a complete understanding of what moves work together in succession. Series like Marvel vs. Capcom and Tekken heavily focus on long, high execution combo strings. You can quickly lose half your health in one combo from your opponent while others, like Street Fighter, focus more on methodical gameplay, like using projectiles to keep space between you and your opponent, or chipping away at their health with small pokes and jabs. Animation in side fighting games is one of the most essential concepts for players to understand. But in fighting games, it's not called animation. Instead, it's called frame data. Frame data is one of the cornerstones of fighting games, yet few players understand what it really is. Frame data is a term referred to the frames of animation in a single move. Frames are the still images inside of an animation. Put it all together, we get the entire move. A frame is 1 60th of a second. This comes from the standard frame rate of most fighting games being 60 frames per second. Frame data decides how fast moves are executed and how fast an opponent can attack after being hit by a move. Moves are broken up into three sections. Startup frames are the windup of a move. Think about it as the action before the move makes contact with your opponent. The longer the startup, the longer it will take to make contact with your opponent, and vice versa. The active frames are when the attack actually makes contact with your opponent. This puts them in a state of hit stun. When you or your opponent is in hit stun, you cannot execute any action. They're stuck until the end of the hit stun. Finally, once you've finished hitting your opponent, you go into what is called recovery frames. Recovery frames are when the character retracts from the attack and returns to a neutral position. All this culminates in a game of who gets frame advantage. 
Take this example of Ryu's Crouch and Strong for Street Fighter 2. Ryu has 4 frames of startup. Once he makes contact with Dalsim, he has 4 active frames. Dalsim would be put in the hit stump for 15 frames on Ryu's active frame 1. Then Ryu would have 6 frames of recovery. If we check the math, Ryu will recover 6 frames before Dalsim gets out of hit stun. This gives Ryu frame advantage, meaning he can throw out any 6 frame or lower attack, and Dalsim would be unable to block it. We would say this is plus 6 on hit. On the other hand, if Ryu threw out any other move like his close for standing strong, once he hits an opponent, he'll be minus 7 frames on hit. Now he's at frame disadvantage, and the opponent can capitalize with a faster attack. There's a different frame advantage for when an opponent blocks an attack. If an opponent blocks, they don't have to go into a state of hit stun, meaning they can recover faster. We would say this is plus or minus on block. When talking about fighting games, it's hard not to bring up rhythm. Some players could be discussing a combo string and say it has a weird rhythm to execute. Or players could say that their rhythm is off when they lose a match. Rhythm greatly influences fighting games, but is often not explained to players. Let's take a look at this Jin combo from Tekken 7. The notation doesn't precisely state when a player should or should not press a button. What happens if I input all the commands as fast as humanly possible? Well, as we can see, this isn't a game of speed. Commands must be inputted with specific timings. Let's see it performed with the correct timing. What dictates the rhythm of this combo? Frame data plays a huge part in the rhythm of moves and combos. Frame data is a division of time, just like rhythm. Within the animation, frames are what dictates the rate of movement. The more frames, the smoother the animation. When looking at the gen combo, this is what the frame data looks like for each move. In total, we have 132 frames. In terms of time, this combo is 2.21 seconds from beginning to end. If we wanted to, we can figure out how the frames line up with a beat. To do this, first we need to find the frames per minute. Multiply 60 frames by 60 to get 3600, which is our frames per minute. Next, we want to find the BPM of the song of choice. Let's take the BPM of the track Infinite Azure, which is 174 BPM. Now divide 3600 by 174, and we get about 21 frames per beat. Let's take a look at the combo notated on sheet music. All the notes are button presses on the controller. Here it is lined up for the first eight bars of the track Infinite Azure. If player wouldn't see this and use it in a match, it's just not practical. But seeing where the button presses land compared to the beat helps us better understand what's happening inside the combo. First, we can see that the button presses are pretty syncopated. Rarely does the player press on a down beat, so trying to line up button presses with the pulse of the music isn't something the player is regularly doing. Secondly, we can see a reoccurring rhythm in this combo. Jin's back 3 into 4 1 occurs two times in this one combo. Both times, we get the identical quarter note rests in between them. This shows a consistency of rhythm inside of strings. Players must wait an equal amount of time each instance they want to use those moves in succession. Combos having the same sequences of moves that are repeated are quite common. A good way for players to practice these strings is with a concept called chunking. Chunking is defined as the reorganization or regrouping of moving sequences into smaller subsequences during performance. Chunkin is thought to facilitate the smooth performance of complex movements and to improve motor memory. Players who take combos apart and isolate individual strings can gain motor memory more effectively. Just like how musicians take pieces apart and practice seconds individually, if one part of the combo is giving you trouble, practice it individually and then try to piece it back together. Let's look at a more complex input and see how it looks rhythmically. The quarter circle special move motion is common across many franchises, 
When executing this motion, the stick moves from first down to down forward, then forward, plus an attack button. With my fight stick, we can hear a distinct rhythm from the switches of the stick and the button. If we line this up to a 120 BPM click, we can hear that the rhythm is 2 32nd notes and 16th note. Of course, for different tempos, this rhythm could be notated differently. However, the same fundamental feeling still applies. Charge moves are unique because players have to hold the input for about a second before finishing the rest of the command. An example is Guile's Sonic Boom from Street Fighter. Timing the charge is quite tricky when first starting out. I know I struggled a lot with it, as it's completely different from all other fighting game commands. While playing as Guile in Street Fighter 4, I tried lining up the release of the hold to a particular beat of the music. I found that you could release a charge move on beat 3 of a stage's music if it is in the range of 120 BPM to 130 BPM. This concept applies to all charge moves in Street Fighter 4, like if any of Vega's or DJ special moves, but not all stages have 120 BPM music. If the BPM is faster than 120, it will land on a later beat. For example, on the stage Beautiful Bejas, the music is at 170 BPM. In this case, players would have to release on beat 4. Another example similar to this is in the game Super Smash Bros. Melee. Considered to be the most competitively technical of the series, Melee has many unique techniques that make the game still appeal to players over 20 years later. One technique has cemented itself as one of the most iconic and best in the game. If players choose the character Ice Climbers, they can use the Wobbling technique. Wobbling, named after the player who discovered it, so an Ice Climbers grabs their opponent and locks them in an inescapable grab. This is done by grabbing them and pressing the A button at a consistent rhythm around 200 BPM. This technique is actually banned in many tournaments due to its inescapability. If a player gets caught in the wobble, it's instant death if done correctly. Ice Climber players must be able to recall this tempo and perform it under high pressure consistently. One question is, how can we recall tempos and rhythms from our muscle memory? Oliver Sacks, in his book, Musicophilia, recalls a story about how he injured his leg in a mountain climbing accident. Without the use of his leg and needing to return down the mountain, his only option was to drag himself across the ground. He fell into a rhythm once he started synchronizing his movements to a song similar to how rowers sync their movements to vocal responses. Once he fully recovered from his injury, his leg still wouldn't move. His brain had seemingly forgotten how to use the recovered leg. After 15 days, he attempted to walk on it, but his motor function wasn't fully there. Only after listening to Mendelssohn's Violin Concerto in E minor, he used the internalization of music to regain what he calls the natural rhythm and melody of walking. With the rehabilitation of these injuries, it often is the case that music and rhythm helps aid patients in recovery. Research has shown a link between auditory rhythm and the aid of motor functions. In their paper titled, When the Brain Plays Music, Auditory Motor Interactions in Musical Perception and Production, Robert Sator, Joyce Chang, and Virginia Penhew use brain imaging to find the effects on the brain of rhythm and music. When test subjects were engaged with rhythm synchronization, such as tapping along to a beat, they would find activity in the brain's motor cortex, basal ganglia, and cerebellum regions. Even when not physically following along to a beat, the brain still has activity in the premotor cortex and motor cortex. Motor imagery may not explain all examples of premotor recruitment during listening. Even when listeners do not have explicit sound movement associations, such as when passively listening to rhythms in a naive condition without foreknowledge about any motor task, they still show recruitment of premotor cortices and the SMA, supplemental motor area. These findings suggest that the SMA and premotor regions may track rhythms simultaneously. Thus, although imagery may well have a role in auditory motor interactions, it does not appear to be essential for such interactions to emerge. In a study done by Daniel Levinton and Perry Cook 
To test humans' abilities to recall rhythm and tempo accurately, subjects with a wide range of musical abilities, ranging from no experience to over 10 years of experience, were placed in a room with a shelf filled with CDs. There was no CD player in the room, and the CDs were never played for the test subjects. Participants were instructed to select a CD with songs that they were familiar with but hadn't listened to in the last 72 hours. Once selected, their task was to envision the song in their head and hum it once they had it in their mind. They tested to see how accurately the subject could hum the chosen song. The results showed that all subjects were between a 4% to 8% margin of error from the actual tempo and rhythm. This indicates that humans have an incredible memory regarding tempo and rhythm. It also shows that humans are innate to recall rhythms and tempos quickly. What's fascinating is that the brain is activated similarly while playing video games. Other action-focused video games have the ability to increase brain activity in the premotor and parietal cortex, where premotor skills, quick thinking, and control of sensory movements are all required. Auditory functions and the motor functions of playing games go hand in hand. Though the link between rhythm and games is very evident, there may not be a correlation to games improving the player's sense of rhythm. In a study conducted by Kiri Miller in 2009, she tested whether there was a correlation between skill in Guitar Hero and a better sense of rhythm in players. Subjects were males ages 25 to 31 years old who had no or minimal musical experience. One half of the group were advanced players of Guitar Hero 2, and the other half were inexperienced players. The subjects tested their abilities at the game by playing random selected songs for increase in difficulty. Once a level of skill was established, subjects participated in a rhythm synchronization test. They had to tap along with the metronome click, and eventually the click is removed, but they had to continue to tap to the pulse. The test was to see how accurately they could tap to the metronome's tempo without the sound of the click. The study showed inconclusive results connected Guitar Hero's skill to a better sense of rhythm. Midler's study shows players don't gain significant improvement in rhythm with more gameplay. Though rhythm games may appeal specifically to the already musically inclined, as Miller's survey suggests, it is interesting to note that even in spite of Guitar Hero 2's distinctively non-traditional musical form, this study does not support the theory that players are improving their sensitivity to meter, rather suggests expertise entails improved performance at the fastest levels of perception and action. Though the study's results were inconclusive, what is presented is quite interesting. Players may not be gaining a better sense of rhythm, but they're gaining higher levels of play with continuous practice. Does this principle apply to all games or just rhythm games? Well, fighting games are based on increased skill and knowledge, just like rhythm games. Players must practice the same combos and moves for hours just to understand a character fully. Similar to how rhythm game players have to spend hours upon hours perfecting songs and challenges, in a sense, a combo is a rhythm game level or a solo. Bringing it back to our previous example, we can see how our brain helps us recall the rhythms and tempos of the inputs in fighting games. It becomes muscle memory if we consistently practice it. An ice climber player must consistently practice wobbling to perform it at the drop of a hat, and a guile player needs to ingrain the timing of charge moves to win a tournament successfully. As a sort of aside, another aspect of rhythm in fighting games is gameplay tempos. Every player is unique. No matter what character they select, they have a specific way they play them. If you watch two different players play Jin from Tekken 7, you can see the vast differences in their play styles. Some players like to play super offensively, throwing a barrage of attacks at their opponent to end rounds quickly. While others like to play more defensively, being patient with their opponent and capitalizing on any mistakes they make. Something I can compare this to is real life boxing. Fighting games are over the top and fictional but they take a lot away from real-life fighting styles. In boxing, the tempo refers to the flow in which a fighter chooses to throw strikes, defend, or evade. Steve Coleman describes it as three different overall rhythmic forms. Setup rhythm, preparing to punch or waiting to counterpunch, depending on the style of the boxer, the rhythm of offensive movement, and the rhythm of defensive movement. Take, for instance, Floyd Mayweather, one of the most decorated boxers in history. Mayweather is best known for his defense in the ring. He's constantly bobbing and weaving his opponent's attacks. He's trying to read his opponent while also trying to tire them out. He evades one attack and responds with his own. Playing the fighting game is very similar. 
players must find the template that best suits their character and react to opponent's attacks. And does your opponent try to hit you with a slow overhead? Block and uppercut them to start a combo. Or maybe your opponent is playing passively. Take a step back and wait for an opening. The neutral game becomes an improv based on the events around you. You and your opponent are like jazz musicians, locked in a solo battle. Both of you are throwing out licks and trying to show up the other. With the knowledge that rhythm is a considerable aspect of fighting games, some fighting games take advantage of rhythm and use it to create unique gameplay mechanics. Slap Happy Rhythm Busters is a fighting game released in the year 2000 on the PlayStation 1. A quite obscure game, Slap Happy Rhythm Busters is a super stylized game taking inspiration from the turn of the millennia street culture. The game is your average 2D fighter until players use a fever attack. A fever attack is when a player fully fills up their super bar. It puts the players into a rhythm game style minigame where the player has to hit each beat to bring down their opponent's health bar. While this happens, the opponent can press buttons that throw the rhythm off to mess up the opponent. The minigame is styled after games like Dance Dance Revolution, with skull and bars that must be pressed on the empty spaces. Rhythm Heaven, funnily enough, has a fighting game concept. The minigame Rhythm Fighter is a fight between two boxing robots. Players aren't strictly following a set rhythmic pattern like any other Rhythm Heaven minigame. The minigame is turn-based, where you and your opponent take turns and put in rhythmic patterns, and each one of you must successfully repeat it or lose the round. This concept is quite peculiar, because it's a fighting game without a neutral game. What we have is a game of fighting, Simon says. Players aren't using movement or gameplay tempos to challenge their opponents, but they're trying to one-up them in their rhythmic sense. Fighting games have been rising the ladder of popular esports. With thousands of tournaments yearly, there is no shortage of high-level fighting gameplay. The players who compete in these tournaments are masters at their crafts. They know all the ins and outs of the games that they play, and some of these players have been playing since the arcade era. The earliest examples of competitive fighting game tournaments can harken back to that time, but one tournament has cemented itself as one of the most prestigious of them all. The Evolution Fighting Game Tournament in Las Vegas, Nevada, also known as EVO, is a yearly event that calls thousands of players from all around the globe to compete to be EVO champions at their selective games. EVO has been the birthplace of some of fighting games' most iconic moments, the most infamous being EVO moment number 37. At EVO 2004, Daigo Umahara and Justin Wong would meet in the Street Fighter Third Strike Tournament. Justin Wong was one of the hottest up-and-comer Street Fighter players from the US, and Daigo was known as one of the best players coming out of Japan. Daigo, a master of time and execution, and Justin, a tactician of fighting game prowess, being able to master any game he picks up. This was a matchup for the ages. Daigo played his Ken against Justin's Chung Li. Both players had one round apiece, this was anyone's game. Justin took a commanding lead over Daigo in the final round. It came down to the wire, as Daigo's health was nearly zero. If Daigo got hit with any move, even if he blocked it, he would have lost the match. Justin used his super to capitalize on this, but then this happened. What happened here was nearly impossible. Daigo used parries, so he wouldn't take any damage from Chun Li's super. This is impressive in itself, but he needed to do it 15 times to parry every single hit of Chun Li's super. He proceeds to hit a devastating combo to win the match. This moment is a masterclass in perfect timing and execution. To start, Daigo needed to input a parry before the attack even came out. He fully read Justin and knew precisely what he would do before he would even do it. This comes from pure game knowledge. Secondly, you must input the parry at the same frame as the attack. This is a 1 60th of a second window. You can't execute this by chance. Daigo had the rhythm of every hit of Super down to the frame. This could only come from hours of intense practice. He was able to recall the perfect rhythm at the most critical time. Rhythm plays a massive role in even the highest levels of play in fighting games. From the hyper-difficult combos, to the advanced movement techniques, 
pro players use trained rhythms to get an edge over their opponents. One way pro players can think of rhythm is as distinct patterns. Humans are very good at recognizing patterns and actively seek patterns in our environment. The same goes for fighting games. Players can see rhythmic patterns in how players move or attack. Fighting games are a game of mental chess. We make moves that are in anticipation of what will come from our opponents. Our observations inform our expectations. But if our opponent subverts those expectations, it can mean checkmate. These observations influence our decision making and how we go about a match. Players can create rhythmic patterns and choose to break them and destroy their opponent's preconceived expectations. Let's take, for example, in Street Fighter. If Ryu throws fireballs at a constant meter, let's say at 60 BPM, which is as fast as the move can come out, a player can read this and jump over to avoid the projectile and counterattack. However, if Ryu decides to delay one of these speeds, his opponent still decides to jump in. Ryu has now broken the rhythmic pattern his opponent was expecting. Now he has the advantage to capitalize when an anti-air move. Some moves in fighting games have delayability built into them, allowing different timings on when an opponent should block. A Combo Breaker 2019, Cherry Berry Mango and Aru faced off. In this match, Cherry Berry Mango uses Jin's 4-3 to get into what is called Zen Stance, a standard tool Jin players use to attack or start combos. However, he can hold this stance and choose to attack or cancel it altogether. Cherry uses it quite often in this match, and usually attacks once he gets inside of the stance. He establishes the rhythmic pattern of going into Zen Stance, followed by an attack. A quick exchange that can be easily blocked or even punished with a well-timed jab. After several instances of him repeating this pattern, he chooses to delay his attack to wait for Aru's reaction. She evades backwards. Assuming he would continue on the offense when attack and wanted to evade, Cherry Berry Mango reads this, cancels Zen's stance to follow Aru. This caught Aru completely off guard, allowing Cherry Berry Mango to capitalize with a big combo. So Aru's observation that Cherry Berry Mango always attacks after he gets in his Zen stance influenced her expectations to avoid it. Creating rhythmic patterns and breaking those patterns keeps your opponents on their toes. You want to strike a balance of rhythmic predictability with uncertainty to achieve discomposure in your opponent. At EVO 2019, Chair Barry Mango encountered speed kicks in the top 128 of the tournament. These players are considered some of the best in the world at their respective characters. Chair Barry Mango of Korea plays the highly technical Jin, and speed kicks of the United States plays the hyper aggressive Horong. Jin is a very versatile character. His toolkit contains a little of every kind of playstyle. But most players tend to play him defensively and patiently. Horong is a purely offensive character. He can keep constant pressure on his opponent with devastating kicks. These two different playstyles can be considered two contrasting tempos. Players have to shift and change tempos of matches to find a rhythm that helps them overcome their opponents, much like real life boxing. As the match starts, both players choose to play safely and wait for an opening. Timing is crucial, and being able to react as soon as you see the opening is what can help them win the match. During the third round of the first game, Speed Kicks begins to ramp up his fighting tempo. As if he took a metronome and turned it up several notches, he unleashes a flurry of kicks that overwhelms Cherry Berry Mango. Cherry Berry Mango up until this point has been waiting for an opening to strike, but now there is no opening. Speed Kicks is throwing a constant barrage of attacks. This increase in gameplay speeds is the recipe for immediate success for Speed Kicks in this match. Cherry Berry Mango doesn't seem to have an answer to this tempo change. What's happening here? Well, let's think about it this way. Think of the piece Chronochromy, composed by Oliver Messier. This piece is a disorienting amalgamation of disjunctive tempo changes, which leaves the listener in a state of bewilderment. These sudden shifts never let the listener become comfortable or feel at ease. One second is at a slow trot, the next a rapid mishmash of conflicting runs. This juxtaposition is a perfect example of tempo changes leading to confusion. Speed kicks switching from a slower, more patient tempo to a higher octane one results in immediate advantage in the match. Cherry Berry Mango can't contain the pressure, but realizes that perhaps his style needs to change to adapt to his opponent. But his trick is he's switching back and forth between tempos, just like the Messian piece. 
who can go from fast to slow. This now exposes Speed Kicks and keeps him guessing on how Cherry Berry Mango approaches the match. Speed Kicks decides to let off the pressure on Cherry Berry Mango to play safer and gauges how the flow is going. This ultimately spells defeat for him as Cherry Berry Mango advances in the tournament. In conclusion, this research shows that there is a clear link between rhythm and fighting games in high level play. From consistent rhythmic patterns for strings and attacks, tempo and timing of input and mechanisms, or individual gameplay tempos, rhythm can help players achieve higher levels of play. Rhythm can also create a sense of competitiveness and can be a tool for player expression and creativity. With this, I hope that this video essay both helps shed light on the subject of rhythm in side fighting games and contributes to the study of rhythm in games at large. I would like to give special thanks to my capstone coordinator, Dr. Sharon, my capstone committee, Dr. Gennaro and Dr. Bertos, and special thank you to my capstone chair, Dr. William Ayers. Thank you for all your help and support.